In your Bible today, the book of Genesis, chapter number one. We're still there. I think this is the fourth week. And let me, for those who may not have been here previously, let me tell you what we're doing. Uh, over and over, I've read by a number of different people, all of whom I respect a great deal, that one of the reasons we're losing people from the churches across America is that we are not establishing people deeply in the most important questions of all, the ultimate questions of life, that what we're doing is doing application preaching, telling people how to have a better life, but we're not answering the the deepest questions of life. And all of those questions are answered, interestingly, in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. This is the foundation of the Christian faith and the great ultimate questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose while I'm here? Where will I go? What will happen to me after this life is over? I mean, those are the really deep and serious, important questions of life. And we find the answers right here. Now, we're moving slowly because I'm not in any hurry. I haven't even laid out the messages all the way through here yet. But I want to just teach and preach this to the point that nobody here will ever ask those questions and say, I don't know the answers to that. I want you to be able to mentally go to the Scripture and say, I know the answer to to those ultimate questions of life. We've even, uh, Jeff has prepared Sunday school lessons based on what I preached And we're even uh, coming back the next week and going through it again. But there's just so much material. You're not going to be bored by that, I don't think at all. And in Sunday school, we'll just follow up each week's message. And uh, you're going to have an opportunity to think about it, to ask questions and so on in a way that you haven't had heretofore. So I hope you understand the importance of what we're trying to do. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, and the reading today begins in verse 26. If you would stand with me as we read God's Word together, Genesis 1, and beginning in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them, mankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then if you would go with me down to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and that's all six days of creation. And behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Thank you, and you may be seated. Genesis, as the name implies, is the book of beginnings. It's the beginning of everything. Before Genesis 1-1, there was nothing in existence anywhere in the whole universe except Almighty God Himself, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches us they were communicating. They talked. The Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Spirit. And in all those relationships there, we learned that there was relationship, there was communication, there was planning as God planned what He would do when He created the universe. So there was something happening before Genesis 1-1, but there were 
there was nothing in existence that we think of today. And in the beginning, God created the heaven. The heaven would be space. In the beginning would mean He created time. And He created the earth, it says in verse 1. And the earth would mean matter. So we have time and space and matter, the three building blocks of the universe without which we could not exist. And then he began to create through six days. He took that initial creation, that watery mass of matter and energy, and he began to create everything that is today. And he created the universe, the solar system, the plant and animal kingdoms. He created man, mankind. He created the, the book of Genesis reveals the first family. It reveals the first government. Genesis even reveals the first crime. It reveals the first sin. It's the beginning of everything as we know it. Now, we're pretty well through with chapter 1 last week, but I come back to emphasize the creation of man. That's what the subject is this morning, the creation of man. And I want you to see that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are not separate accounts. They're complementary accounts. They complement each other. They form a unit, if you will, each one containing information the other does not contain. And God gave us these two chapters because He wants us to understand His creation. Because as I've already said, this is important to every facet of your life. It doesn't matter who you are. You need to understand where you came from, your origin, where you're going, your destiny, why you're here, your purpose. My, this is this is profound, profoundly important stuff. I cannot overemphasize that. You just need to study the print off the page here in the book of Genesis, and you'll be a well-grounded human being then. Now, in verse 26, the Trinity, <clears throat> I say the Trinity because the pronouns are plural. And God said, let us, that's plural, that's the Trinity, make man in our image. There's the Trinity again. After our likeness. And so you see the Trinity, as it were, held this heavenly council, this divine council. And they determined that they were going to create man and to create man in a special way that is not said about anything else. They're going to create man in the image of God. Man is going to bear a certain resemblance to the Creator Himself. Now, the question comes up, and you've heard this probably in school somewhere. Was Adam the first man? Was Adam the first man, or was there a long process of evolutionary development among sort of humanoids, human-like creatures before Adam? Or was he really the first man? The Bible seems to imply it. It just starts here. But if you will just keep your finger there in Genesis and go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And go down to verse 45. And there the Word of God gives us the answer. And so it is written, the first man, Adam. Underline that in your Bible. The first man, Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, referring to Jesus, was a quickening spirit. Go down to verse 47. The first man, first man is of the earth, earthly. He bears the resemblance to the earth as well. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And so twice here, and I think later in the chapter it says it again, it specifically states that Adam was the first man. Now, you've all seen this chart that we have here for you where we have this ape-like, this monkey figure here, and it develops through the years until finally we have a modern-day human. You, you, you'll see that in a lot of books. 
Now let me tell you, there is no factual reason in the world for that to exist. That's a theory. That's the way somebody somewhere visualized the development of man. Obviously, they didn't believe in the Bible when they made that chart or when they took that theory out. Now, you see it, and because it's in a science book or it's in a, uh, you know, anthropology book or whatever it is you're studying, people assume, well, they wrote, put it in a book, it must be true. Well, don't you fall for that. Don't you fall for that monkey tail. There, God said, the first man that I ever created was Adam. I created him out of the earth. That's the Word of God, and that's somebody's theory. That's a, an a hypothesis. That is not based upon truth. Somebody said it like this. Man has always been man, and the apes have always been the apes. And I agree with that. Amen? Now, let's look at the creation of the first man's body here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man because now he is not creating him totally from nothing as he did when he spoke the basic materials of the universe into existence. He formed man of things that already existed. He calls it the dust of the ground or we would call it the earth, or we would call it matter, if you will. But God formed him from the materials that he had created in day one, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul, the creation of the first man. Let's look at the first man's body. He created it from the dust. And we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47, that the man was of the earth earthy, not earthly, earthy, meaning he was made from the earth itself. And how could God make a man, a man's body from the earth? Well, because the earth has all the ingredients that are found in a man's body. And we know that, uh, we know that if you die, you're going back to the earth, that if they bury you, it'll take 20 or 30 years, but there'll be nothing but dust left. If they cremate you, it'll take about six hours, and there'll be nothing but dust left. One way is the quick way, one way is the long way. But dust to dust thou art, and to dust you will return. And so I picture God taking his workbench. I don't know if he had one or not, but I'm imagining right now. He took his workbench, and he put 100 pounds of clay. I heard a song like that one time. And uh, he put 100 pounds of clay up there on it earth from the earth, and he created a body. There was enough sulfur to rid a large dog of fleas. There was enough lime to whitewash a backyard storage building. There was enough fat for six bars of soap, with some people seven. <laughs> there was enough iron to make about a dozen ten-penny nails. There was enough phosphorus to tip a box of kitchen matches, enough sugar to sweeten 10 cups of coffee, <laughs> enough potassium to make a box of shotgun shells, enough salt to fill an average size salt shaker. If I wanted to build a man today and start from nothing, I would need 50 quarts of water, 3 pounds of calcium, 24 pounds of carbon, and a large supply of O2. And so the Bible says in Psalm 139 and verse 14, a wonderful phrase. It says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. How God could take all those things and mix them up and speak to them and form them and put them together, and we would have a, a man. And now we've got about seven and a quarter billion of them on this planet. But they're all made out of the same thing, are they not? And when they, we die, we find we go back to those elements. God put within us a heart that from the time you're born, and if you live an average lifetime, it will beat about 2.5 billion times. He gave you two eyes that are superior to the most sophisticated camera that's ever been built. He gave you two ears that can identify and differentiate thousands of sounds. He gave you a brain 
that weighs about three pounds. It has billions of components. There's never been a computer yet built like one human brain. We are fearfully and we're wonderfully made. The discovery of DNA some years ago has been one of the landmark scientific achievements. And may I, may I say that nothing in all the DNA studies that have now been done cancels one word of what the Bible teaches here. That DNA has been a great help, in fact, to those of us who believe in divine creation. And the DNA simply proves that man is absolutely distinct and he's superior to every other living creature that God made. Not a little bit superior, vastly superior to every other creature. We need to hear that in these days when we've elevated animal life in some cases to almost the same level as human life. And you won't find that. That's not a biblical teaching. Man is the only creature that God created that was made in his own image that resembles his creator. Only man has an erect posture. Other animals, they may get up on their hind legs, a polar bear or, you know, a, a gorilla or something for a brief period of time. But we are made to live vertically like this, standing and walking. We're the only one with an erect posture. Our orientation is up. We're, not, we're looking up. We're not looking at the ground like most animals do. We are different from every other creation in our intelligence. We have the ability to hear a fact, to come into contact with a fact, to retain that fact, to organize those facts, and then to use those facts, to apply those facts to life. No, you, you, you can't tell me of any other living creature that can hear a number of facts retain those facts, organize them, and then begin to implement and use them and apply them. You see, we're, when, when people just classify us as another part of the animal kingdom, there's a great deal of ignorance in that. They need to really go ahead and, and find out that how vast the difference really is. Our countenance, we have facial expressions that are absolutely essential to communication. And, you know, I know you think that your dog has an expression and tells you something, uh, or your, your, your cow or whatever, whatever animal, but they really, not, not anything like a human being. I don't know about you. You know, we talk about people that don't change their expression as being poker-faced. You know, they just, you talk to them and nothing changes. Uh, the Lord saw fit to give me several hundred of them to preach to three times a week. <laughs> and it's hard to know what they're thinking because they never give you any verbal expressions, you know. But the reality is, is that's really important. You don't like to sit across the table and talk to somebody who their expression never changes, do you? No, a great deal of our communication is, we call it body language today, but it's, it's the countenance. And we're different. You can't look at a grasshopper or a snake or any other animal and, and, and understand what they're thinking. But you can often look at a human being and tell, well, I know what they're thinking right now. And then, of course, God gave us the ability to speak, to articulate our thoughts and our feelings, and to read. Have you ever thought about what a miracle reading is? You see, there's these little symbols that are printed on a piece of paper, and we put those symbols together in various kinds of combinations, and we look at those, and our brain translates that into thoughts and feelings and information. Don't tell me that we're just a little bit above the apes through our image of God qualities. We are special. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. So 
I'll tell you another reason I think God designed our bodies like this. Now, follow with me carefully. God knew that one day he would come to the earth. And when he came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ, he would live in a body. And so God designed the body of all of us to be a body that he would be proud to put his son in when he came to the earth the body, fearfully and wonderfully made, made even the body, not in many, but in some minor respects, the image of God. And through my body, I know what is happening in the world around me, the senses. So I hear, I see, I smell, I taste, I touch. Those five gates, all the information that's out there in my environment comes into me and goes to my brain, and I am conscious of it because of the way God created me. That didn't just happen through random selection, folks. Number two, I want you to notice that God breathed into his, this man, and he became a living soul. He became a living soul, chapter 2 and verse 7 again. So now let's picture the body's complete. The Lord has created the body. He's laid it out here. All the organs are intact. It's, it's very functional. It's ready to go, but it's it really is still a corpse at this point. And then God breathed. Now, the Bible uses these pictures to teach us. It's not like God puffed out his cheeks and blew into the man like you would blow up a balloon. I don't think that was happening. But I think it's the way we can understand that God breathed into that man. And in doing that, he created the soul. So the man has a body and we have a soul. The word is nephesh, soul. And it has to do with that part of us that's a very complex thing. Let me describe it to you real briefly. What is the soul composed of? If you're taking notes with me, just you might want to write down. There are five different things I can immediately think of that are the soul. When you group them together, this is what the soul is. One, the soul is the mind, the intellect. It's rational thought. It's the ability to reason. And no other living creature in all the universe can multiply Three times four is 12, and three times five is 15, and three times eight is 24, and so on. I hope I got all that right while I'm thinking and preaching here. But nothing, I mean, all I know, they can condition some animal, and when they hold up the chart, he, you know, he points to the right place. But But when you and I do that, we're reasoning, we're thinking, we have rationality, we have capacity that nothing else has. That's the soul. And then the soul is the seat of emotions. It is the seat of our affections. The Song of Solomon, verse 1 or 7 of chapter 1, thou whom my soul loveth, the soul is said to be the part of me that loves. And then the soul is composed of the will, the mind, the emotions, the will. And the will is self-determination. When I choose to do what I do, the ability to act, it is the ability to make decisions. It, It means that I'm a free moral agent. You can offer me something and I can say yes or I can say no. You can say yes to Christ. You can say no to Christ. Whosoever will may come. See, the will is the capacity to make a decision. Animals, for the most part, don't make decisions rationally. They, they operate by instinct. They're programmed. But you and I have this capacity. It's part of what God put into our soul. And another part of the soul is the conscience. The conscience. Um, a sense of things being morally right or wrong that you do something or say something, and then immediately you feel it, and you say, ah, I should not have done that. That's wrong. Well, no other creature has a, a sense of morality of right and wrong except a human being. And then there's imagination. That's a part of the soul. 
the ability to visualize things that really don't exist, and then to make plans and follow them through. An architect pictures in his mind a building. He draws a, a blueprint, and then they send it out, and the contractors take that initial dream, and they turn it into a reality because we have the power of imagination. You ever listen to a couple of kids playing? And here's the way they play. Uh, pretend that the couch is, is, is a castle. And you know, suddenly that couch sitting in that living room is, is a castle. And pretend I'm Robin Hood and you're John. And so, you know, in their mind, they're going through this pretend stuff. And when I was a little boy, I'd go in the backyard and take a ball bat, and I was Mickey Mantle. I'd turn and go left-handed then because he was a switch hitter. And I was pretending in my mind. I was in Yankee Stadium, and these cheering mobs of people were cheering me on, and I was living in that realm of imagination. Only human beings can do that. You're looking at me like there's something strange about me doing that, but really, and we all live in that place of imagination, and we pretend, don't we, because it's a human gift that God gave us. It's part of the soul. My soul gives me self-consciousness. My body gives me world consciousness. My soul gives me self-consciousness, self-awareness, self-determination. I can make choices. I know who I am. You know why people today are having identity problems? Because they don't know Genesis 1 through 11. I know who I am. God created them male and female. I am a male created by the hand of the Almighty out of 100 pounds of dirt. You know what Jesus said about that soul? That mind, emotion, will, imagination, conscience. Jesus said, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world and you lost that? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? You know why he said that? Because the soul differentiates you from every other creature. All the animals have an elementary form of soul. They have some awareness, but the gap between them and you is like a gap measured in space. What would it profit you if you lost your soul? Well, if you lost your soul, you would no longer be human. Think about it. And then it says that God breathed his spirit into Adam. He breathed his spirit into Adam. Now, in your Bible there, you may want to mark it over there in chapter 2 and verse 7. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that word breath there is the word in the Hebrew language for spirit. It can be translated breath. It can be translated wind. It can be translated spirit. Several different ways it's translated in the English Bible. And so God breathed his spirit if you will. The breath of life was the Spirit of God. And so we now have a body. We have a soul. But we also have a spirit. And my body gives me consciousness of the world beneath me through my five senses. My soul gives me consciousness of other people and myself. And my spirit gives me consciousness of God. So you see... No animal has a consciousness of God because they don't have the spirit of God in them as Adam had that day. I want you to turn with me and look at a verse. It'll be worth your time. Proverbs chapter number 20. Proverbs chapter verse 27. And it tells you something critically important about the spirit of God in you. The spirit of man that God breathed into him in creation, is the candle of the Lord. And what does he mean by that? Well, what does a candle do? A candle gives light. The candle illuminates. So it's the Spirit of God in us that, that, that illuminates, that makes us aware to see the light of the gospel itself. 
to know God who is the light, Christ, the light of the world, the Word of God, the, the, the book of God that gives us light. And the Spirit is the part then that makes me aware of God, the spiritual sense that I have. And, I, and my spirit lives in my, with, attached to my soul, I believe, and it receives the impressions that my body takes in and my soul experiences. And listen to me carefully. The battlefield between right and wrong, between good and evil, is in the spirit and in the soul world. That's where the battle is happening so often with us. Now, some people really try to separate the soul and the spirit a lot. Don't do that. The soul and the spirit, there's a relationship between them, but they're different, as I'm going to show you. And they should be distinguished. And, but they're always connected. In the Bible, they are never separated. They're always one, uh, one and the other. They're, they're, they're closely identified. Go with me to one other verse here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to biblically, logically substantiate what I tell you about these things because we're building this foundation for our thinking. This is our worldview. This is our philosophy of life. This is why Christians ought to think different than the world around them. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23, the very God of peace sanctify, that may, means make you holy, sanctify you holy, make you holy, completely holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body. You see, there is that trinity, that tripartite person that we are. God was a trinity. God is a trinity. And he made us in his image. Therefore, we are a trinity. And how are we a trinity? We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. He has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are the body, soul, and spirit. And I'm a trinity because I resemble the God who made me. And I try, I've tried to think of this in different ways through the years. Here is um, the best illustration I can think of, of a man is a football. And it's the best one I could come up with this, this time at least, a football. And here you have a football. You look at it and you see a leather outer covering. And this would be the body. And then you have a rubber bladder inside that fits right in that, in that leather case. It's attached to it like the soul is to the body. And then the football still is pretty useless until you pump some air in it. And now you have the spirit. It's energized. It's alive now. And you look at that football. It's a tripartite thing. It's a, it's a trinity. And so are we. And if you don't read your Bible and study your Bible, how could you ever understand what you are and who you are? The house with three rooms. That's what I am. Body, soul, and spirit. And in verse 27, after God created him, he created him in his image. I've got to hurry, but I want you to take these down if you're taking notes with me. No, there are seven things about the image of God that you need to know. What is the image of God? The image of God is, first of all, I'm a person. I have personality. Every one of us different in our personality. We're not clones. We're not exact replicas of anybody or anything. Each of us are different than everyone else. We have personality, personhood, we call it. Secondly, the image of God means that I'm capable of relationships. God was capable of relationships. He, God the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world, John 17. Capable of relationships is part of the image of God. When you relate to other people in a positive way, that's part of the image of God. And thirdly is the ability to communicate. 
God communicated to us through His Word, through His Son, through His creation. To speak languages, to write, to think in symbols as God did and as He does. And so that part of the image of God is my ability to communicate. Part of the image of God is my conscience. I, I understand moral morals, morality, right and wrong. Somebody said, man is the only creature that God made that can blush and the only one that needs to. And how true, huh? Because that conscience, that conscience speaks and tells us what I was doing was wrong. The image of God gives me an appreciation of beauty and order. Why do you love music? Or why do you admire art and order and beauty in the world? Because God created order and beauty in the world. And music is sung in heaven. And so we respond in the same way because we're made in the image of God. And then we worship God. And until our spiritual needs are met, until our soul is in right relationship with God, I can tell you that there will be no peace in your heart. God made you for Himself. As the old philosopher said, in the heart of every man there is a a God-shaped vacuum. Something that needs God and that reaches out to Him. Worship. And it's universal. We've never found people that didn't worship. And then the image of God means that we're immortal like God is. That God put within us that soul and spirit that's ever living, never dying, endless, dateless, timeless, and eternal. The immortality of the soul. And that image of God separates us from all the other living creatures. The ape, the dolphin, the eagle, the dog, the horse, doesn't matter. Eons of distance between man and any of them. And tragically, we won't get there today, but in chapter 3, Adam sinned. And when Adam sinned, the image of God was broken. And we have the image of God today, but it's distorted. It's hardly recognizable. It's like looking at the mirror in the fun house at the fair. It's not an accurate image of what God really looks like. And we look at man today and Violence and crime and hatred and prejudice and evil. And it's hard to see the image of God in man. But you and I who have been redeemed, we're to be different. And when people look at Bill Monroe, they ought to be able to say, I can see the Lord in him. And when I live like some of the people of the world, And people say, I thought he was a Christian. What they're saying is, I can't see the image of God. Then God put him in charge. I just have to stop here. But he gave him dominion. You know what he did? He made Adam king of the world. (laughs) He made Adam the king of the world and gave him responsibility for it. We'll pick up there next week. Will you bow your head with me?